governments to try to change behavior, uh, uh, human behavior, in order to uh, protect uh, the atmosphere. So it obviously has major relevance uh, to this question of climate change, both how we approach it uh, scientifically and how we approach it politically. Uh, Mario Molino, I do want to mention uh, one other, a uh, couple other associations that he has. He's director in, 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 of the uh, Mario Molino Center for Strategic Studies on Energy and the Environment in Mexico City. And this is one of the uh, most prominent, not only in Mexico, but else around the globe, uh, research organizations that deal with multiple kinds of environmental questions, but in particularly with climate issues. And of course, he's uh, currently a professor at the University of San Diego. After he speaks, uh, Dr. Alan Lesher of the AAAS and myself will uh, briefly uh, interview him up here and then open it up to questions uh, from those of you in the audience. In your program, you have a card on which you can write a question you might have, and assuming you can do that legibly, uh, our folks might be able to read it uh, as they quickly try to sort through and collect uh, these questions. And so immediately after he speaks, if you'll pass those toward the center, we will have somebody uh, picking those up. If you're online watching this, uh, you can use a hashtag AskRFF. <clears throat> I guess that's Twitter uh, you're using, and I guess everybody but some of us ancient uh, types uh, understand and know uh, quickly what that is and how to use it. And I gather it's very useful. Uh, and you're <laughs> you are gathering something about me, obviously, in this process. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we are uh, thrilled to have, it's really part of, uh, at RFF, our Nobel Laureate series, uh, and we are very delighted to have uh, Dr. Mario Molina. Not starting on the right path. <laughs> he was very good on the ozone hole. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> does this work? I think so. So this one doesn't matter. Okay, well, uh, I'm very honored uh, uh, to have the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon. As Phil Sharp already mentioned, we had a, a very interesting session this morning. Perhaps some of you are still here, but those are the real experts in economic risk analysis and climate change. But I, uh, I certainly want to, to thank uh, Resources for the Future, Triple AS, and of course Alan Leshner, Phil Sharp, but, and, uh, but also Molly Macaulay to helping organize putting all this together. And I want to mention, of course, my admiration for Larry Linden, philanthropist, who has done so much for our worries, including climate change. What I, what I want to do. Uh, in the next minutes is not to take too long so that we have time for uh, questions and discussion, but I want to talk about uh, climate change from my perspective, not just the science, but perhaps some science policy connections, but again, just uh, stressing my own perspective on, on this uh, subject. And let me just start with mentioning this report, the What We Know report, which we did uh, uh, in, with the AAAS uh, support. And you can see here uh, some very prominent scientists. We, we went through an exercise trying to get some climate uh, science experts to try to summarize what is known about this problem, just from the science perspective, to, uh, with the idea to communicate it efficiently to the public. We, we have yet to do the second stage, to, uh, really an effort to, to uh, explain all this. We're working with professional communicators. We, normally, we scientists are not very good at talking to the public and even less communicating with the press, but we are uh, involved anyhow in, in this effort, which is only halfway in terms of this uh, communication. But... The, the sort of things that we summarized are, are you can see on this uh, slide. Uh, 
And I'm going to connect them with some myths that are, that are out there in, uh, in the public mind. And the first myth is that uh, really climate change is complicated. Some scientists think it's something to worry about, but some others think not enough is known. So we should wait until they settle the, their minds. There, there's not much we should do until that's the case. That's really a myth because we have a, a, a sort of a, a consensus which is not common in science. It, uh, this has been uh, done by doing surveys and so on. There are papers with, with these types of results. I won't go into detail. But the consensus is that indeed uh, climate change is certainly happening and it's most likely connected with uh, human activities. Now, wh where does this myth uh, come from? Well, this is a repeat of the consensus if we ask uh, what is the scientific evidence. But the media coverage, this is a little old, but it's, it's still uh, correct. Media coverage certainly does not uh, represent the consensus and neither public perception because it generally follows, generally follows, of course, what is expressed in the media. Now, why, why is this happening in this fashion? Well, one important reason that perhaps if, if we have time we can discuss further is that this issue has become politicized. It's been, uh, whether you agree or not with climate change has been connected with whether you're Republican or a Democrat and so on. And that doesn't make sense. We're talking about science. But the other reason is that there has been, it's very well documented, a very significant effort from some interest groups with millions of dollars of financing to really question the science. And they succeeded quite a bit, as you, as you see here. So it's the result of a concerted effort uh, and interestingly, some of the people organizing this public relations effort were the same ones that did manage to delay the, the uh, action from governments connected with the tobacco industry. Okay, so again, these are things that are reasonably well documented. And the other side of the coin is that we scientists have been sort of slow in responding and we're not very good at communicating to the public, hence this effort that we did with the AAAS. Uh, so what I want to do next, I will talk about some of the other points uh, subsequently, but let me talk next about the science. I know some of you are real, real experts on this issue, but what I want to do is to explain it as we would do to uh, the public, to non-scientists, to see what is well established and what is not well established. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so here we have our planet. Uh, the question is, how does climate work? The atmosphere plays an important role. It, it's just like the skin of an apple. It's a very thin layer that covers our planet. But before we worry about the atmosphere, the question is whether science can tell us something about what should be the average temperature of, of the planet. And indeed, science is, is uh, able to respond to that uh, quite well. And the point is we have a, what we call a thermal balance. Okay. And uh, the way I would explain that to people in general, even to young students, is suppose you have a, an electric heater at your home that has a, a wire that gets red hot. Okay. When, when it's first cold, you connect it to the wall. So the temperature of the wire begins to increase. You can feel it with your hands until you see it. But it doesn't keep increasing forever. Okay. At some point, the amount of energy that it gets from electricity from the wall equals the amount of energy that it's losing to the room. Okay. And so the temperature then uh, becomes stable and that has happened with our planet now for millions of years. Uh, the point, however, is that our planet receives energy uh, in the form of visible light from the sun, but it loses energy in the form of infrared radiation. And again, going back to this heater, uh, you can see when it's red hot and if you put your hand close, you, you feel it uh, strongly. But even if you turn down the power so that you don't see it anymore, you can still feel 
something coming out of that, and that's infrared radiation. Okay? And that's how the planet loses energy. Now, this is very well established, but the interesting point is, if historically, it, do we have enough information to establish that temperature? What should be the temperature of the planet? And yes, I won't bother you with details, but it's historically very interesting. Namely, in, in the graph up there, I'm just putting this fact I just uh, explained, that the planet is in thermal equilibrium, receives energy from the sun, and loses it as in the form of infrared radiation. It's all the same type of electromagnetic radiation, but at different wavelengths. But I, I have an equation down there uh, by somebody called Max Planck. It turns out that the, the question that people ask in the 19th century is, is precisely the one we are asking. If you have something, could be a planet or, 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 or uh, some object in the laboratory, uh, the question is, how much energy does that object emit, and what's the connection with temperature? Okay, so that was an important question that was, it was measured empirically, because you could measure in the lab the connection between that, the, the, these two things, the, the energy and the temperature, but it was really in 1900, so it's at the beginning of last century that it was answered quantitatively by an equation that Max Planck first fitted empirically, but then later, very interestingly, it revolutionized science. It's really the equation that sets up uh, quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics is a lot more strange than climate. If you want to explain to people, that, uh, and if you look at very small objects, you have a little particle and you have two slits. That little particle goes through both slits at the same time. It's sort of very different from the experience that we have. It's only one particle. Okay? It's all sorts of strange things uh, happened. That's, but even that is no longer in question. Nobody would question today whether quantum mechanics is correct or not. If it's not correct, we wouldn't have these sort of things with solid state physics. Okay? Or chemistry now, it's really quantum chemistry too, and so on. So that it's a very well-established uh, basis of science in a much more complicated realm, if you want. But, ironically, it's the same equation that tell us, tells us what should be the temperature, the average temperature of, of our planet, because we can measure how much is coming from the sun. And it turns out if we do just a simple calculation, that temperature is minus 18 degrees uh, Celsius, zero degrees Fahrenheit, and so on. So, Something is wrong. If that's correct, we wouldn't be here because the planet would be frozen. Okay. So what's wrong? Well, what's wrong is that the, the, it's not that the that quantum mechanics is wrong or that the physics is wrong. It's just that we have an atmosphere. The planet has this very thin layer, and so the, the answer, of course, given by the equation, is correct. But it's not the temperature at the surface of the planet. It's, it's a temperature somewhere above the surface. And the surface is not at minus 18 degrees Celsius, it's at plus 15. So you have this 33 degrees Celsius uh, difference, which is called the natural greenhouse effect. And it's there because we have this very thin layer in the planet. How does that work? Well, the energy that we get from the sun not all reaches the surface. About one third is reflected to space by clouds, by snow. But two-thirds get all the way to the surface and warming the surface and warming the planet. Because the atmosphere, other than the clouds, is transparent to visible radiation. But it's not transparent to the infrared radiation emitted by the surface. And that's why it works like if you had a blanket. The planet has a blanket which increases this uh, 33 degrees Celsius, the surface temperature, and that explains why we are here. So to summarize the natural greenhouse effect, uh, energy from the sun, other than what is reflected to space, gets all the way to the surface because the atmosphere does not absorb it. But the energy to set up the temperature, in contrast, is uh, to, to a significant extent absorbed by the atmosphere. Okay. So that, that's uh, quite reasonable. That it, I'm talking about all these issues because this is where there's no question that the science 
is correct. Okay, sometimes you hear things like, oh, science can always change. You can have somebody perhaps coming up with different theories. Imagine you have somebody today that tells, oh, I don't think molecules exist. <laughs> we, there are probably other ways to explain how things work. Well, no, science is not that flexible. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Whether molecules exist or not, at the same time that the Max Planck uh, equation was put forward, at that time it was a, a significant question. Okay? It was not that clear what that molecules existed at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Okay. Anyhow, the, let's move on because there's something quite interesting in addition to, to this basic science, which is how does the atmosphere function? How does this blanket function? And wh what I have here is a representation of the composition of the atmosphere, which everybody knows it's mostly oxygen and nitrogen. But just to explain it a, a, in a bit more detail, uh, we know, of course, that the pressure decreases with altitude, and that's why you can no longer breathe at the top of Mount Everest or so. But just for the sake of explaining the composition, let's assume that the entire atmosphere were to be at the same pressure we have here at the surface, roughly one atmosphere. If you compress all the air there is, it would only occupy a layer of about eight and a half kilometers, okay? mostly nitrogen and oxygen. If you blow up 1%, the remaining 1% of that uh, portion of the composition, you get mostly argon, an inert gas. All these gases are transparent to visible radiation. That's why it gets all the way to the surface, but also to infrared radiation. So most of the atmosphere is, again, transparent, not just to the incoming radiation, but to the outcoming radiation. Yeah, if the atmosphere were to stop there, if you had nothing else, then the original result I mentioned from using the Planck's equation would be right. The surface would be at minus 18 degrees Celsius. But there's this little bit of additional gases, water vapor, carbon dioxide, and a few others, which we call the greenhouse gases. Those are the ones that do absorb infrared radiation, just a tiny bit. Water vapor absorbs, and this can be measured, okay? In the laboratory, the infrared spectrum from space, you can also measure how much energy comes out as a function of wavelength. And so water vapor absorbs roughly three-fourths of the energy emitted by the surface, and the rest, carbon dioxide and a few other gases, one-fourth. Uh, just to, again, to explain to in, in general terms, how much is that, 20 meters, 3 meters, as a gas? But if you were to compress it so that it becomes a liquid or a solid, you would have only two and a half centimeters as a layer of liquid water in the planet, and that's what changes the temperature dramatically, and only about four millimeters, say, of dry ice, okay? So it's a very tiny amount. Now, uh, something else. What determines how much water vapor is there in the atmosphere? Well, it's very sensitive to temperature. We know that we have practically unlimited, unlimited amounts of water in the planet with all the oceans. But that water, some of it evaporates, and that's what we call water vapor. But as the, as the air parcels rise, they cool, and then whatever evaporated, a good fraction, most of it actually condenses, and that's how you get rain and snow. And the amount truly in the gas phase in the atmosphere is very sensitive to temperature. So imagine for a moment that you remove CO2, carbon dioxide, from the atmosphere, which is a natural component there, okay? because it absorbs one-fourth of, of this energy that keeps the temperature of the planet. The atmosphere will certainly cool, and that means that water vapor will start to condense. And so that's a process that would continue, and you can do all sorts of modeling, but if you were to do that experiment, it's clear that in a matter of uh, one or two decades, the planet would freeze. So water vapor is important, but it responds, we call it a feedback, it responds to how much carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and, and the few gases that do absorb infrared. That's why we call CO2 the thermostat of the planet. And it, it makes a lot of sense if you look at paleoclimate. You can explain all sorts of temperature variations looking at 
carbon dioxide. There are other factors, uh, orbital parameters that cause uh, ice ages. I won't go into those details, but clearly CO2 is crucial for climate. Okay? So, so far, this is all the natural greenhouse effect. The science is very clear. This is not in question. Okay. So now let's see what has happened recently. What I've talked here, we can talk about millions of years, but more recently, say 10,000 years. Let's look at the past 10,000 years. What has happened with carbon dioxide? Well, it's remained 250 to 80 parts per million. It's this two, millimeter, two millimeters of dry ice that I was telling you about, a very small amount, which is responsible for, for climate, basically. And it goes up and down. It hasn't been higher than 300 for millions of years and so on. It suddenly jumps. On this scale, it's practically a straight line. And so those methane, which is another uh, greenhouse gas, not quite as efficient as carbon dioxide because there's a lot less, but on a molecule per molecule comparison, it's about 20 times more effective suddenly jumps. So what happens? Well, it really starts with the Industrial Revolution, but it became, the, the jump is even more striking in the second half of last century. But it really starts since society started burning fossil fuels. And you can measure the isotopic composition of CO2 in the atmosphere. It's clear that that has to do with fossil fuels. Okay. So these are measurements. Something is happening very recently to the gas that controls climate. Okay. So what next? Let's look at the average temperature of the surface, which is not easy to measure, but if you measure it in enough places and you calibrate thermometers in some, all sorts of ways, uh, you get that in the last 10,000 years, temperature, of course, has been higher, 0.4 degrees, up and down. There are uncertainties, but there's a jump. Just since the Industrial Revolution. Okay. And the job is very striking. It's not very big. It's 0.8 degrees centigrade. It's not, not a great deal. But to be the average temperature, it is truly uh, something quite important. So the question is, given everything science knows, is there a connection between these two measurements, average temperature and CO2 and methane in the atmosphere? And, well, there are different ways to answer the question. One way is to say, well, climate is very complicated. We have uncertainties. We don't understand exactly how it functions. Clouds, for example, have feedbacks in terms of how the atmosphere responds to changes in carbon dioxide and methane, atmospheric particles also. So the answer is we are not sure. But there's another way to answer it. And the scientific community, let me just give you one example. There are many other groups that have done that. But this Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that shared the Peace Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore, I believe it was 2007 or so, they attempted to answer the same question. They agree. We are not certain. But in, in 2007, they say, we think the probability that there's a connection is 90%. So it's quite likely. And then every four or five years, this group comes up with a report. So another report just came out uh, this year, starting last year. And they increased the 90% figure to 95%. Okay. So if here, here is something that, that a question I raise that has to do with semantics. If you state climate change science is settled. Well, no, there's a 5% uncertainty. It depends how you interpret the word settled. Okay. So it's best to be explicit. Yes, there are uncertainties, but wow, 95% is, is quite significant, I would say. Okay. So let's move on, because I'm moving quite slowly. And the next question is, what else is happening? A myth that is quite common is we shouldn't worry about it because if something happens, it will happen at the end of the century. So let our grandchildren 
worry about it. Okay. No, it's already there. We, we can see climate change already occurring and summer uh, ice in the Arctic is one of the striking uh, uh, sort of consequences of this change, which again, it's just recent. This wasn't happening before and you can see it in just a decade or so how much it has changed. But there are other things happening. There are also floods. I mean, I just put here an example. We had some floods in Mexico and in the Philippines. There are all sorts of places where floods have been there. And you can actually see that in all continents, the free frequency of floods has increased. Okay. So these are the so-called extreme events. But these are events that are already happening. So the question is, does does this have anything to do with global warming? Well, the scientific community is very conservative. So maybe two, three years ago, well, there were still lots of questions. We're not sure. We don't have enough statistics. But the last couple of years, we have seen a change. And the point is that, uh, uh, well, we can see another expression with Sandy that was it had such an enormous effect here, here in the U.S., uh, the point is the following. You cannot tell that any one event like Sandy or a particular flood or so was caused by climate change. That, that's, a, that's a wrong answer to a wrong question. What seems to be clear, and this we could, of course, expand a lot, in a lot more detail, is that the intensity of a, 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 some fraction of these events, a good fraction of these events, that intensity has indeed been affected by climate change, and that comes from measurements. And uh, it's, it's uh, easiest to really measure when you do heat waves, because if you see there's a, a sort of a Gaussian distribution that has shifted to the right. So if it used to be a heat wave 50 years ago, three standard deviations, uh, it's very rare, is now a lot more common, just because the curve has shifted to the right uh, and these are measurements from satellite of, of certain tropical latitudes. It's not something coming out of a model. It, it's just observations. So the bottom line is that something is already happening that is already costing significantly in, terms, in economic terms to society. Okay. So the next question is, can we do something about it? Because there is yet another myth, but this is... I'm stepping out of science now, which is the following. Well, let's assume climate change in, is in fact happening. And maybe you're right. Maybe it's, where it's already beginning to happen. But it's a consequence of burning fossil fuels. And who would think about not using fossil fuels anymore? It's out of the question because the economy depends so much on the use of energy that we just cannot do anything about it. Okay. So that, again, is a myth because if you look at it much more carefully, as I'll, I'll explain in the, in the next few graphs, uh, there's, there's much that can be done. But first, just very briefly, th there are some events called Conference of the Parties that uh, have to do with the United <coughs> Nations, uh, trying to see whether you could reach an international agreement to do something about this problem. One of these events happened in Copenhagen. I was lucky I was there with President Calderon from Mexico, but what was quite interesting, there were more than 120, like 130 heads of state, okay, prime minister, presidents, and so on. So that's very unusual. You very rarely get a, any type of meeting with so many heads of state, and they agreed, okay, let because of input from the scientific community, perhaps economists as well, uh, it's feasible to attempt to have a limit to the temperature increase, which is two degrees. Well, there are all sorts of criticisms, but the point is that this is something that has been already discussed by these heads of state. The, the uh, people at the UN uh, meeting, the UNFCC, the negotiators, however, didn't agree. So nothing happened. This was just, uh, 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 if you want, wishful thinking. But what would it take? So that's why there's no international agreement, even though the heads of state in principle agree to that. But the next point is, 
how easy is it feasible to keep the temperature below 2 degrees? Well, it's very difficult. If we plot emissions in, in, and adding CO2, methane, and uh, a few other CFCs and so on, you can see that the, the business as usual path, it's going up, of course, because the economies are thriving. And just look at China, how 8% per year and so on. Uh, so we are on this reference path very clearly, and you would have to change it quite dramatically if you wanted, according to the best understanding of climate, the temperature not to go above these two degrees. Well, can this be done? Well, there's at least, there are some efforts, okay, this is a paper is now a little bit old, but from my colleagues at Princeton, uh, which again, they plot these emissions versus time, and we are above the green portion of the curve because emissions are going up. And to really address climate change, you would have to change to the blue portion. But the, the answer is, in principle, yes. Society can actually do that with the so-called wedges. That means there's no simple, single solution, a silver bullet. You have to do lots of things at the same time, but it's feasible. Use energy much more efficiently. Use renewable energy. The prices are coming down very fast. Uh, and so on. So let me give you a few examples. Uh, wind energy is already used quite extensively in some places in Mexico, for example. It's, it's, uh, some industries are using that because it, it's uh, about as costly as, as fossil fuels, if, if not cheaper in some places. Okay. But this is one possibility, using a type of energy that does not emit CO2. Uh, solar thermal energy is very promising, but at the moment it's mostly photovoltaic cells that are being used, but the price has dropped strikingly, okay? So that's beginning to, to be more, more and more feasible. Uh, but then there's yet another question. What about nuclear? Well, that's very controversial. You know, in places like Germany, they decided not to use nuclear energy. On the other hand, the new generation of power plants, research is going on, they can be built very safely and hopefully not very expensive, so that's yet another potential solution. But this, is, again, is, is uh, up to the discussion. But I'm going to summarize all this with this view graph, and looking at the time, I might stop here. But let me explain this view graph. This comes from my colleagues at MIT. I was a professor at MIT for many years, and so this comes from the group of the joint program. And what is interesting about this effort at MIT is they use a very large model of the climate, including biological sources and so on, but it's coupled to a very large model of the world economy. So two things are coupled, and it's probably one of the largest, if not the largest, model of the physical climate. And this is how they answer the question, not whether climate change is happening, not whether it's real, we're, we're taking that for granted at the moment, but what will happen towards the end of the century? And they point out, with business as usual, we're using, if, if you look at this as a roulette, we're playing with a roulette in, to the left. And they run the models many times, say, well, two degrees is very unlikely, but wow. It's possible that the temperature will go up more than six degrees. That, that's really scary. But they said, no, we can actually change the roulette if we take the sort of measures I just indicated, okay, uh, a new wheel. And just to explain that, I do that often with students, assuming some of you have gambled at some point in, in your life. Let's assume, let's say we're playing roulette and you have one shot. And I give you $100,000 if you win. How do you win if the temperature doesn't go up, say, more than four degrees? Ah, but you have the roulette to the, to the left, okay. But then I make you an offer, okay, $100,000, but it's not very likely. I'm willing to change roulette. How much would you give me out of these $100,000? Okay. 
well, I would make a survey now, but some students say, well, I've gambled maybe 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars. That's reasonable because I'm almost surely going to lose with this one or I'm almost surely going to win with the other one, okay? Well, the answer, if I can, this is simplifying a little bit and so on, but the answer that a, a, a number of economic studies come up with is it's one or two percent of global GDP. So it's a thousand or two thousand dollars. It's really a bargain. Okay. It's relatively cheap to change roulette. And what is very scary about the one in the left, it, I won't have time to, I have that in the, in the other view graphs, but I think I, I want to stop for discussion, is that we have two things to worry about when the temperature changes a lot. One is abrupt climate change, namely that the, that the climate changes modality and you have practically irreversible changes like have occurred in geological timescales. And that, that, that could have tremendous impacts. But the other way to worry about it, six or seven degrees, and that, yes, 50 million years ago, the planet was indeed that much warmer, but it, it took 10 or 20,000 years to get there. We're doing that in, in in just a few decades, I think. And at that time, there were crocodiles in the North Pole. So it was a little different with six or seven degrees. It, that's really scary because in many places in the planet, people would not survive outdoors. So you, you would be confined some portion of the year to live in some sort of bubble or, or to move. Okay. But that, that's a very significant probability. We're not talking about 10 to the minus seven. We're talking about 10... 20%. And so from this perspective, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of almost uh, ending, from this perspective, given these types of risks, given these types of probabilities, not 10 to the minus 7, but 1, 5, 10% of something occurring that could, uh, with impacts that would be very damaging for society, it doesn't make sense not to change roulette. It's an insurance that we should pay for, regardless of the actual exact cost of the impacts. And that we do both for economic reasons. It's a lot cheaper to do that because the damages are very costly, but also for moral or, or, or it's a matter of values. Okay. You, we want to leave a planet to our children where they can have the same uh, quality of life that we do have. So it's a combination there, either or, economics or just the values that uh, most of us share. But let, let me end with, up with an example. Uh, Alan Leshner was supposed to be here yesterday, but his plane was delayed. I fly a lot, and sometimes it happens. A pilot comes on and says, we're sorry, we have a technical problem, so we're going to have to fix it and we'll start perhaps in one, two, or three hours. Please remain on the plane. Wow. I have a meeting I want to reach, but what can you do? But you might hope, or perhaps there's another pilot that says the same thing. I'm sorry. We have a technical problem. It'll take us two or three hours to fix it. But I know some of you are in a rush. So we are going to take off anyhow. <laughs> And don't worry, there is only a 10% probability that we won't make it. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> That's <what I'll> <laughs>
that concept around, you come up with something called a scientist citizen. And that is to say that they use their accomplishments for the betterment of society. And Mario, to me, you really epitomize that. That is somebody who has achieved great things scientifically and then you've chosen to uh, try to, to help society use that science for its betterment. And so I admire that greatly. Having said that, I have a question. Sure. <laughs> so we've talked about what we know. Mm -hmm. We've talked a bit about what we should do. And I hope everybody was paying attention during the short section on the wedges. So there isn't a simple single silver bullet, or better, a gold bullet. Um, but, but rather, there are many things that have to be brought to bear. And so I guess my, my question to you would be, so what, what we know we got, what should we do we pretty much got. What, what I have trouble uh, or feel frustrated by is how are we going to get it done? Okay. What do we have to do to move from, okay, we know what to do. Okay, we know the problem. How do we get it done? Okay, that's, that's a tough question. First, let me clarify. I should have added that, that science doesn't answer that question. Science doesn't even tell us what we should do. Shoulds, it's a matter of values, okay? They can tell us, if you do this, this is what might happen, but it's our value system that responds. And then... We had a nice session this morning. In principle, the question could be answered by uh, economic studies. What makes sense and how much should we invest and so on? But I say in practice, that doesn't work either because we're not convincing politicians to do that. So in practice, we have to communicate with uh, decision makers in government, with leaders. And we have a tough problem. I think it's changing here in the United States that unfortunately, first of all, to get an international agreement that, that you would put a price on emissions, that seems to be the most efficient way. Again, this is no longer science, but maybe economics, but that, that's something it could be revenue neutral, politically acceptable and so on. But if it's an international agreement, so there, there are no free riders, okay? There are no, people, no countries that would take advantage of that. These agreements have to be ratified in the United States by Congress, nothing else. Okay. So if Congress is now Republican dominated, they have stated very clearly that they would not ratify such an agreement. So we hope that's, that will change. Hopefully they, are, they move from saying that it's all a hoax and that we are all very dishonest people because we are helping some of our colleagues just to get more money, okay? Or that the science is complicated and we are really naive. We don't quite understand what's happening, okay? But the point is that it's politically driven. So how do we go about it? Why do I mention the United States and why do I mention Congress? Because that's a very important, if not the bottleneck for an international agreement. We just heard that China made some commitments and other countries, I work in Mexico, they certainly have made commitments and so on. So uh, even India that is sort of reluctant to do that, it's, some of it might be fostering. I think once the United States would be willing to ratify something like that, it would be more likely that we would get to such an agreement. But meanwhile, we shouldn't stop, of course. Well, President Obama is doing, I, I work with him, so that's biased. <laughs> Tomorrow I have a PCAS meeting, so it's the advisory group to President Obama. He's doing whatever can be done without Congress, okay? So uh, I, that, that's a, a partial answer, but we have to do that in every country. While before we get this agreement, everybody should make commitments. What are they willing to do? If nothing else, let's start with the win-win measures. So let me just do a sub-question, if I can, because you did uh, a lot of the most influential work and then were very influential in getting action around the ozone hole and, and right. dealing with the, the issue of fluorocarbons in the atmosphere. Are there lessons to be learned from that? Sure. About what, you know, we actually have made progress there. Right, right. 
the lessons are, first of all, it was a Republican administration when the Montreal Protocol was passed, so it's not, it should not be a party line. But the second thing is the objections were similar to what we hear now. Oh, it's going to be incredibly costly. Lots of jobs are going to be lost. But we were able to work with decision makers. It was not necessarily a, a roots movement that we convinced all the population. It, we convinced the right people. So that's perhaps an important message, except that now in Congress to convince them one efficient route is to, to get the public to, <laughs> to tell them, okay? So indirectly, that's just the way we would do it. But that's what happened. And in that case, it was easier because we had only five or six large industries. And they agreed, okay, if the science is clear, okay, let's do it. And they were able to come up with replacements like we have renewable energy efficiency. And we're not talking about stopping fossil fuels right away. It's something feasible, the, the, done at the right pace. Uh, so th there is a lot to learn. But on the other hand, we only have one example of a successful global environmental problem agreement, which is the Montreal Protocol. So it's not much to count on. <laughs> yeah, but it, it sure helped. Well, why don't we turn to uh, questions from the audience or online. And um, Pete Nelson, our communication director, will look okay, well, out. We have one question that really touches on the theme of today's co conference, and I'll say it verbatim. Uh, what we know is bad, but what we don't know is worse. So how badly should we want to know more? In other words, what's the economic value of getting more science? Um, well, I can give you an opinion there. In fact, this is something that came up this morning. It's very clear that society should invest more in science because we, uh, we could, in this fashion, perhaps reduce the uncertainty. But I, I want to be clear there. We will not, in a relatively short amount of time, which is when we need to react, we will not remove the uncertainties very significantly. So that's not something we should count on, but it's very important so that we can do better adaptation and so on and so forth. It's very clear that that would be an obvious, very good investment for society, but perhaps uh, equally, if not more importantly, society should invest a lot more, two or three times as much, in uh, energy technologies. Because the price is coming down, and if that happens, then you have less of a fight in terms of the economic uh, implications. And so. Fortunately, that's happening already, but given the risks that we're talking about, society is not investing enough, and it's already billions of dollars, okay, but that's 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 uh, yeah, that's what would be rational if society were to act that way, which is unfortunately not necessarily the case. No. Sure. Uh, well, we have some questions uh, imploring the, uh, the creation of a Carl Sagan for climate science, mm -hmm. and asking scientists to go more on the offensive and the uh, education on this issue. And so, uh, we're wondering if you could talk about. Uh, your views on that and how that ties into the recent uh, AAAS report. Well, that, that's what I mentioned at the beginning. We set out to do that. We were very conservative, not exaggerating in any way and so on, so that it really reflects the consensus of the community without getting into specifically what should people do or and so on. Perhaps we were very shy in terms of potential catastrophes. Okay. But the point is, it's very clear that we have not done a very good job in the scientific community of communicating uh, with the public. Okay. We, we need, fortunately, we are learning and we're hoping we, we'll be able to, uh, to function better. Okay. And we have a lot to learn. That's something that did not happen before. We have a lot to learn that people that know a lot of, about communicating in general. So we use the wrong language and the wrong approach, but there are professional communicators, as I mentioned, that we should be working with so that the public understands what we're uh, talking about if we do it correctly. I wonder if but, you could just elaborate a little more on that, the conservative approach that has been taken. That was part of the conversation in today's conference about the uh, IPCC reports, which have progressed over almost 20 years, uh, and, and sort of how you see those reports, uh, which some people originally saw as alarmist and uh, non-scientific, and now 
Well, anyway, I'll let yeah. you, I'll let you uh, right. characterize how. But see, that, that's what we're talking about, risk. And I, I mentioned, and we talked about that this morning, the two types of risk. One is for what's already happening, the extreme events. Okay? But the other one is this red part of the roulette. If we keep going, we could have really uh, catastrophes. And scientists are very worried about talking about that because they are then perceived as talking as being exaggerated. But should we just talk about what the public expects without criticism? No, I think if there is a real risk of catastrophes happening, and if it's more than 10 to the minus 7, it's okay to talk about that. Not with the expectation that it happens, but as a powerful way of reasoning that we should do something Soon. So that's what I mean by being a bit too conservative, that we tend to reflect this reaction, particularly from the deniers, that we are all exaggerating, that this is uh, not likely to happen. It's possible, but wow, we are not going to, we don't want to gamble <laughs> on that possibility. Well, if I understood several of the people commented today, is it's, it's also quite possible and probable that the IPCC reports understate That's right. the sure. risk that we are uh, But it's probably for the same yeah. reason I'm uh, right. explaining that they're worried about how they are going to be perceived. But if you describe it properly as a matter of risk and so on, I, th I think it should be all right. Yeah. Take another question. Uh, there, there's a question about... Uh, uh, how do you think uh, the characterization and understanding of potential tipping points have changed uh, in recent years uh, and how that affects the, the right-hand tail of the distributions? I, I had in, in the slides, I, I didn't show, one of them was this report from the National Academies about abrupt changes. And he, here is one perception, for, again, from the experts, the scientific community. We have some here that probably know a lot more about that than I do, but here is a summary. Uh, there are certain tipping points that have been identified by the scientific community, whether the ocean circulation will change. Some are happening, like the Arctic is already melting, as we say, but some others, the Amazons might die off and so on. But a few of the, the tipping points that this report examines, including release of methane from uh, permafrost, okay, they claim... When we look at it in some detail, it's not quite as likely as it appeared. But then they come up with a conclusion. But the main worry is those tipping points we, don't, we haven't identified. Okay, these are the surprises. Okay, so that's a very big worry. And even release of permafrost, okay, maybe it's not quite as likely, but the probability is not 10 to the minus 7. Okay, it's still significant. So I think that's where the community is learning to perhaps communicate more, more with the, the economists that really know about uh, the tales, the risk, and so on. And science is, is, is trying to, uh, to have a point there, but I think sometimes with the wrong uh, magnitude of the risk has been a worry. I, I have one more. I apologize for intruding. <laughs> but we, we really had in a, an interesting way, sort of a landmark conversation today because uh, economists and the rest of the scientific community don't actually speak together that frequently. That's right. And, and I was very struck today that uh, the economists actually bring us a great deal of information, not only about the cost models, but the risk models, as right. you just suggested. Do you think that speaking in those terms would be as effective, more effective, something effective yes. with policymakers? Th that's a very good question, but he, he, perhaps I can summarize it this way. First of all, it's very important that we can communicate across disciplines, okay? Science, economics, if it's a science, I believe so. <laughs> and, uh, but also yeah. policy, social experts, and so on. But as, we, as I mentioned this morning, at least my opinion, it's not going to be enough for economists to agree or to come up with a sensible, unanimous type of agreement. Why? Because the next step that you point out, we need to be able to communicate that to decision makers. And like the general public, many of them are really not well informed about 
risks. Okay, it's something that the public misjudges. When you're talking about small numbers or big numbers, that sometimes they they have really a very uh, bad conception of what it really means. So we do have a job there, not just with the general public, but with politicians as well, to really make this point. What's a risk? Why should we worry about it? But we, we do have lots of examples. I mean, we, be, we make buildings in Mexico, for example, that are safe now if there is a large earthquake. They were not safe when we had a, an earthquake in, in the 80s, so a lot of them fell. So that costs money, and we haven't had an, an earthquake that large. But it's a very reasonable investment. But we're talking about much smaller risks, okay? It's that, that we have a huge earthquake if it's at, uh, we're talking about small numbers compared to some of the numbers we're talking here with climate change, and we still invest that money because it's very sensible. Dr. Molina, we've uh, reached the, uh, almost the end of our time here, and I wanted to give you just an opportunity if there's a closing uh, few remarks you want to make. Uh, uh, we'd be delighted. Well, I, uh, well that's uh, challenging, but I, <laughs> I think I... It, it, it's along the lines of the last comment that it's, I think we're making progress. It's really important that we communicate across disciplines. But in the same manner that we think to communicate to the public, we're beginning to talk to these experts in communication. We should also be talking about experts in policy. Okay. How do we get <laughs> Congress to change? We're beginning to do that, but I think... Very often we have been very naive about that. We just started to communicate with some uh, uh, um, Republican congressmen. So we're, I'm learning the hard way. <laughs> but maybe there is a community out there that, <laughs> that should be able to tell us, to answer your question, in practice, how can we do better? And we have to do that internationally as well. That, that's... Uh, we're making lots of advances with, with important countries, China, India, certainly Latin America, and so on. We should certainly continue to do that. But maybe I end up with this not. I'm really an optimist. I think rationality <laughs> should win. We are no longer in the age of astrology, as some still are. <laughs> so I hope rationality wins. Oh, we're certainly delighted to hear that. Uh, I, I want to first thank uh, Dr. Alan Leshertner and the uh, AAAS for co-sponsoring the work today that went on and, and uh, your appearance here, Dr. Molina. And we certainly appreciate your being here and uh, hope the audience will help me in thanking you for, for coming. Today.